And a few weeks back, he gave the center a big gift to endow this. So we're delighted that this is the first uh, event since we have renamed it as a Nardone Family Seminar Series. So I want to start by thanking Dave Nardone for his very generous uh, gift. Now our featured speaker today is uh, Peter Williamson, who's going to be speaking on Ecosystem Edge, Sustaining Competitiveness in the Face of uh, Disruption. Peter is a professor of international management at Cambridge University's Judge Business School. He is a, a very distinguished scholar in the field of international business and strategy and has written some very influential books, including one on the Metanational Corporation. Also someone who knows a great deal about companies and businesses in China. Uh, he's also been a partner in several projects. I think we've done a book together and uh, co-authored several articles and is a good friend. And uh, I'd really delight Peter to uh, welcome you to this uh, uh, webinar event. In, in normal times, we would have had you in person, uh, but this is a, a pretty close approximation, I think, to that, uh, that experience. Uh, <clears throat> He's going to speak to us on this topic, which is also the title of his latest book, Ecosystem Edge, published by Stanford University Press. Now to have this conversation with Peter and to sort of pick his brains, I requested our distinguished colleague, Fernando Suarez, uh, to act as a moderator for this event, he, and he kindly agreed. Fernando, welcome again. Thank you, Thank you for, for being part of this. Fernando is the Jean Temple Professor of Entrepreneurship and Innovation at the Damore McKim School of Business. He's originally from Chile, so he's got the Emerging Markets Connection, which, which is something <laughs> I always like to point out. Uh, <clears throat> we need to get you, Fernando, to do more work on Chile, but, uh, but that, that's, that's another topic for conversation. Uh, but Fernando got his PhD from MIT and then has taught in several uh, top schools around the world. He was most recently at uh, Boston University and we snatched him from there and he's been with us the last few years and really helped to make, helping to make uh, Damon McKim uh, a very much stronger uh, school. And uh, his field of expertise really ties into the topic of uh, Peter's book. Uh, he studies industry formation, industry evolution, industry dynamics, and you know, the whole ecosystem phenomenon is something that is very much, I think, tied into that, uh, those sets of issues. So I thought Fernando would be a great person to lead this uh, conversation. So I'm gonna turn it over to Fernando. Again, Peter, welcome, and looking forward to this conversation. I'm gonna pull back and turn it over to Fernando, who will take it from here. Thank you, Thank for you Ravi. Thanks a lot for the introduction. That's very kind of you. And Peter, welcome again. This is great talking to you again. Uh, pleasure to be with uh, you. Yeah, it is my pleasure actually to be <laughs> moderating this. So Ravi, thank you so much for the opportunity. It, it is true that platforms are actually pretty close to my research heart. Uh, in the past uh, you know, few years, uh, I've been you know, transitioning from my uh, old work on dominant designs, which was kind of on product industries, to what that means in the digital world. And in fact, I'm writing two or three papers now as we speak that have to do with, uh, you know, uh, the translation of that old research into this digital world of platforms. So I, I have lots of questions. I thought that, you know, uh, Peter's book was super interesting. And I have lots of questions for him. And, and I hope we can all contribute to uh, make this uh, a very interesting and engaging discussion. Uh, the topic is certainly interesting. And it's certainly, you know, driving a lot of the economy today. Uh, in this country and many other countries. Um, so let me, uh, you know, I think the way that I like to organize this, and, and Peter said he was uh, okay with that, um, it, is that, you know, if perhaps we give Peter about 10 minutes to present, you know, sort of an overview of the book. Um, and, you know, I also like what motivated the book? What, what are the issues that he's thought, you know, needed a bit more of answers and where managers actually needed some help? Um, and then after that, I will probably start with a few questions, but just to break the ice and hopefully, you know, we'll get more questions from the audience as well. I actually have lots of questions. You could be for a whole hour, you know, <laughs> I interact with me only, but I think it would be much more fun if we get other people to, to join the conversation. Okay, so Peter, why don't we start with that? Let me give you 10 minutes. I'll be kind of the timekeeper. You know, I'll give you about 10 minutes 
uh, for that you know presentation uh, introductory presentation and then we'll start with q a but thank you very much fernando yes well i probably won't even take 10 minutes because i i wanted this to be really a q a session but uh, let me let me address some of those things to start out with and uh, where did the book come from well it was had long gestation period actually goes back to about 2008 when I was working with Arnaud de Mer, who was the Dean of the business school in Cambridge and I went there from INSEAD and we started looking at innovation in companies around Cambridge and the interesting things we we noticed is that they weren't just doing innovation inside the company by themselves they seem to be working as more of a biological ecosystem with a network of partners. And we're intrigued by that. So we started talking to them about it. And um, in the, we found that companies responded very well to this idea of you know, building a network of partners to expand the capabilities and knowledge that they were able to access. And they also told us, interestingly, that they're often using ecosystems without knowing that they were using ecosystems. They, they sort of got into this by solving a, a set of problems that they might have been coming up with a new value proposition or a new business model where they didn't have all the capabilities and knowledge uh, in-house to do that. I mean, a good example of that today would be something like a car company moving to a mobility system, it's very clear that the car company doesn't have all the uh, capabilities that you need, you know, that range very widely to, to create autonomous vehicles with car sharing, with, you know, interaction with other road users, with charging points. With, so, I mean, there's a whole set of things that go well beyond uh, what was inside the, the original company. So, so, and that's why we subtitled the book uh, Sustaining Competitiveness in the Face of Disruption, because we think that disruption requires you to come up with a new business model, and it's quite problematic to try and do that if you have to learn everything yourself. So this idea of bringing partners with different knowledge uh, together uh, to do something new in terms of your business model uh, was important. But what the executive said to us is, we think we're doing it. It's very interesting you've come up with this idea to sort of systematize what we're doing. But the question we'd like you to answer is how, how actually do we uh, uh, stimulate and catalyze one of these ecosystems? And, and, and the first thing that we we found about that is of course that you can't command and control it. Indeed, to command and control it would, would be to destroy a lot of the potential benefits that you might get from it. So I, I, what we started to write the book about really, our, our objective was to help managers understand how they could lead an ecosystem. Not, not only why you might want an ecosystem, uh, what an ecosystem is, but how you would lead it. And uh, so perhaps, perhaps I'll say a little bit about what were the keys we found about how you go about leading one of these ecosystems. Yeah, that'll be, that'll be great. Yeah, that'll be great. Before I do that, I probably just should say what one is. Uh, <laughs> And <laughs> because a lot of people talk about platforms and two-sided markets and so on as B ecosystems, and, and we would contend that they're primitive ecosystems. And the reason we would contend that they're primitive ecosystems is that there's not a lot of interaction between uh, the partners that is not moderated uh, through the lead firm. And the, the kind of ecosystems we started seeing emerging in Cambridge had a lot of interaction between the partners that wasn't always moderated through the lead firm. And that changes, if you're going to uh, work with an ecosystem, a leader ecosystem that's like that, where you don't control everything and, and there's things happening between the partners in the network that you're not even part of, 
uh, you need to have a different approach to, to, to uh, working with it. So for, for us, what an ecosystem is, is a network of partners that complement each other's business to make everyone more successful. And they coordinate their investments and they learn together and they innovate together. So it's a very dynamic uh, kind of idea. And it, and it really is a true network. Um, and therefore, when I ask executives to, to think about drawing an ecosystem for a new business model, the one thing I tell them is I don't want to see hub and spoke. Please do not put your company in the center with all these people just connected to you because <laughs> that is not really going to get the benefits of the, uh, the, the ecosystem. And as I just mentioned, the benefits of the ecosystem are basically threefold and we might look into this a little bit more later but the, the first is discovering a new value proposition where you don't know exactly what it looks like so you can't just set up a supply chain uh to do it because you don't know what all the roles are going to be uh and who who has to do what and what how you would measure their performance so You've got an idea that there's value out there. I just mentioned the kind of mobility system. So you can see all the advantages for the end user and for efficiency and so on. But it's not that clear exactly what the value chain might look like. Uh, so you've got to discover what it looks like. And that requires a different interaction between partners than this kind of hub and spoke system. The second thing it's good at is innovation, to speed up the process of learning and uh, to bring together, as I said, this dispersed knowledge and capabilities that isn't inside one firm, but is scattered around all the, all the partners. And, and the third thing it, it brings you is flexibility or agility because there's a self-organizing element to this ecosystem where partners might come and go or change their roles or learn new things or invest in new things. And, and again, that, that is one of the reasons why you can't simply uh, do a command and control uh, system on, on, these, on these ecosystems. So. Uh, they're the three things, discovering a, a really new value proposition, uh, speeding up and enriching your innovation and providing flexibility and, uh, and agility. Um, so what, what, do you have to, what do you have to do to lead these ecosystems? So we, we basically found six things. I'll, I'll just run through them quickly and then perhaps we'll stop and and, and okay. you can ask some questions. So, so the first is you, you, you have to demonstrate that you really believe in this ecosystem and that you're prepared to invest in it because um, what we observed is everyone wants to join your ecosystem once it's successful, but nobody wants to join it when you're trying to get it going. So there's a lot in the book about how do you kickstart this process, but one of the things that you need to do is invest in the ecosystem. That, that might be uh, sharing some of your knowledge or capabilities with partners. It might build, be building tools to, uh, to help partners, but you have to do something to really put your money where your mouth is and invest in it. Uh, the second thing we found is that you, you've got to co-op the right foundation customers, or in some cases it turned out it was actually the customers, customers, uh, and, and they aren't necessarily the largest customers. Because interestingly, your largest cu customers often have too much invested in the status quo. So we found the most interesting uh, foundation customers are the people who are challengers. And they, they have to um, believe, they have to have a need that there's no existing solution in the market can satisfy, otherwise they won't invest with you to, to innovate. And they have to also feel that while you might give them some first mover advantage, um, that other people will adopt this innovation once it gets going. So uh, that's the second thing. The third thing is that you have to uh, design some kind of roadmap for how you see the, 
process of discovering the value proposition and developing the ecosystem will work. And, and why that's necessary is that uh, it doesn't have to be exact. It will need a certain amount of flexibility, but it needs to be stable enough so that the partners can invest in it. If you keep changing your roadmap all the time, you will obsolete the investment the partners have made and they won't, they'll be, they're pretty missed, <laughs> miffed about that. <laughs> so you, you, it's, a, it's a balance between having sufficient stability in the roadmap's direction so they can invest, but also the flexibility to discover this value proposition. Uh, the fourth thing uh, is that you, you need to communicate uh, the value of joining to your potential partners. So you not only need to have a customer value proposition from the ecosystem, but you need to have a whole series of partner value propositions. So the answer to the question, why should I partner and invest with you in, in developing this thing? Uh, the, 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 the fifth uh, thing was shrinking the barriers to joining. So uh, how do you actually make it easy for the partners to join? Uh, in one way that people often do that is uh, uh, waiving any joining fee, but it's much more than that. It, it's thinking about how do you reduce the amount of the investment that the partner has to make to get over the hurdle of joining the ecosystem. The, the sixth thing is, is that you probably need to restructure your organization so that it can work with external partners. That's, that might require you to build a, a, a specific partner organization within your company. It's also kind of learning to lead people that don't work for you because you've got a whole lot of people out there in the ecosystem you now depend on who you can't tell them what to do and the normal kind of bonus incentive systems don't work because you don't work for them. They, they, they don't work for you. So you have to figure out how to, um, how, how to actually incentivize them. And of course, the final thing is you need to monetize the ecosystem. And I, I think for now that we might come back, uh, back to that, but we, yes. we've spent quite a lot of time in the book thinking about you know when can you monetize it and, and when do people fail to monetize it after they've built a lovely ecosystem they can't make any money out of it um, and what do the kind of toll gates you put in the ecosystem look like to to earn some money so uh the the book mostly focuses on those seven things which are really about how do you lead an ecosystem so i'll stop there i see you looking <laughs> your phone so <laughs> this is, i just looked at the phone you were perfectly on time you know uh, just, just one more minute that's great so, so, so let me i mean let me go off script here a little bit and ask you something that really caught my attention when you said you know like the platforms are just primitive ecosystems and uh right. you now being a little bit of a platform researcher myself i think it's such an interesting and, and i do and i do get what you're saying which is actually very interesting uh, the idea of you know this is these are not hat and spoke but the reality is that, you know, I, I see this more as a continuum and I want your reaction to this because in reality, a lot of the platforms today do allow for uh, the communication between the partners. So for instance, you know, the smart home uh, platform, you know, this is actually a big battle now between, you know, it's going to be Alexa, or Google, Google Nest, or, you know, and many other competitors. Um, a lot of those uh, uh, connections now, that, you know, when you, when you connect to uh, Nest, for instance, through your APIs, you can actually also connect, you know, with other uh, complementaries are doing something else. So, for instance, so that your, you know, your smoke alarm can actually yeah, can actually talk to your, um, you know, to your alarm system, so that you know it will sound the alarm also, or something like this, or actually lock the doors, or you know, whatever, chat the boiler. So, so, so I think you know, it, it's it's much more of a continuum. I mean, I don't think you can say platforms is you know haven't spoke and then you know these are different. No, yeah. I just want no. your reaction to that. Yeah, so let me respond to that. So <laughs> I'm not saying a platform can't be an ecosystem, or at least the core of an ecosystem, but what I am saying is that the platform itself or alone is not an ecosystem because right. it doesn't allow these interactions that you described. And, and, and interestingly, it, when we were looking at the book, we, we, there's a, 
Ali Barbers in the book, are, I can talk about that later, but because uh, I work closely with them. But we also wanted to look at Amazon because everyone knows Amazon. <laughs> so, and when we looked at the Amazon e-commerce, we basically found it's a pretty primitive ecosystem. <laughs> but when we looked at Amazon Web Services, we found it's a platform with an amazing ecosystem around it. <laughs> so, and, and most of the innovation inside AWS actually occurred in the partner network of people providing uh, software, providing migration services to the cloud, providing complementary technology. And uh, interestingly, while the e-commerce culture inside Amazon is not very good at getting beyond hub and spoke, the AWS system seemed to be really good at doing that. <laughs> they did a lot of things to share knowledge and to encourage uh, the partners to build out the value proposition around the platform while they focused on having the best cloud platform <laughs> that could interact with this ecosystem. So uh, I, I, I think the point I'm making is that Platforms can be the core of an ecosystem. Two-sided markets can be the core of an ecosystem, but they're not the whole ecosystem. <laughs> they can be part of it. There's a lot more to ecosystems than that. And I think this is where people have, have sometimes taken too narrow a view, especially in the research world, because uh, platforms and two-sided markets are a lot more tractable uh, from an analytic point of view than some of the other things you mentioned <laughs> that are around this. Uh, yeah. But I think actually the things that are around that are equally important. Yeah, no, that's, that's great. It's very interesting, actually. And you're right, it's very difficult to collect data on, you know, the communication between the partners. It's a lot, uh, you know, I, we had that challenge by ourselves in our, our research. Let me ask you this, you know, because you, you, your book, for instance, you know, centerpiece of your book is, you know, Alibaba and Amazon Web Services. And, you know, we all talk about those things. And they have been quite, you know, extremely successful, both of them, both of these companies, you know. Um, but uh, the reality is that if you look at, you know, ecosystems in general, um, oftentimes the company that is at the kind of center of the ecosystem, you would, you would call leading the ecosystem, um, doesn't actually uh, end up with the lion's share of the, of the value created. So I, I, wanna, I want you to speak about value creation versus value capture. Because, you know, uh, if, uh, if you take the example of IBM, for instance, in the 1980s, that, they, you know, they created the famous IBM PC and everything, um, that ecosystem became really complex and they just could not grab the lion's share of the market. In fact, they ended up selling their, their, their unit to Lenovo uh, and, and actually losing quite a bit of money uh, over time. So can you speak about that also? What are the tension between value creation and value capture in, flat, in ecosystems? Yeah, and, and it's, it's, a very, it's a very important tension uh, that's there all the time because one of the things the ecosystem leader is, is doing all the time is deciding as the ecosystem generates knowledge and innovation, what do I share with the ecosystem to make it more successful? And what do I keep proprietary so that I can monetize it? So, and uh, so, so you mentioned IBM. I mean, they, they created an amazing IBM compatible ecosystem and orchestrated pretty much all the aspects of it. But as you say, they didn't make any money. And, and the reason that I think that's the case is they didn't control any key piece of the puzzle that the ecosystem needed to create value. So in the book, we call it following a star uh, 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 the keystone, that we call it the keystone from the old book, the keystone advantage. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, 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 and it's something you have to have, it might be IP, it might be data, it might be knowledge that the ecosystem can't do without. And, and that's what gives you leverage in order to uh, take profit out of the ecosystem. And, and IBM's problem is that Intel had that, and Microsoft had that, but IBM didn't have a keystone of any type. So they were doing all the orchestration, they were creating a lot of value for the ecosystem, but they couldn't actually monetize it. So you, you, you need to find that 
Keir Stone, uh, that thing that you know, can leverage. And interestingly, in the case of Alibaba, what we found that is that it's data. Uh, it's actually their ability to capture the data and use the data in new ways that is the thing that, that gives them leverage. But once you've done that, you need to put um, toll gates around your, your, your keystone. So they could be license fees, they could be royalties, they could be fees from selling value-added services into the ecosystem, they could be creating new profit streams from the uh, data that you get in the ecosystem. So for example, Alibaba has created a great business on credit ratings for uh, people by using the data from their e-commerce ecosystem. And uh, their data is so much better than what the banks have because right. they also have customer <laughs> satisfaction data, they have inventory data, they have reserves data, and the credit rating is up, updated every second. So <laughs> they created a whole new business out of using the data that came out of their uh, uh, e-commerce ecosystem. Peter, I, I mean, I think this is, a, this is a great example because one of the interesting things about this ecosystem is that actually once you, you have the control of them, the leadership of them, you can actually expand your businesses in a much better way. This is actually what Amazon has done. Remember, Amazon started selling books. I mean, yes, yeah. Yes. What the company today. But let me ask you a question. So on that keystone, because that seems to be the key, you know, to the, the answer to my question, but, but can you know what the keystone is in advance? I mean, as somebody who actually, you know, researches the emergence of markets, I mean, when things are in flux at the beginning of a market, you know, everything is, you know, the, can you really determine in advance what the keystone is? Because, you know, you know, looking back, it's easy to see, oh, that's what it was, the key thing. But, you know, <laughs> at that point, it didn't seem that obvious. You mean, so right. any advice uh, Okay. Yeah, so great, a great question. By the way, let me just add one more point on the other thing. The really successful ecosystem leaders were using the ecosystem to reinforce their keystone all the time. So right. they were using the learning and innovation of the ecosystem to make their keystone stronger. One of the other cases that we spend a lot of time in the book that's, that's much less known is advanced risk machines uh, in the UK. Um, all the people listening use their product because it's in 95% of every mobile phone in the world. Um, uh, but you don't know about it because it sits in the background. And, and those of you who do know the company will, will know that it was sold to SoftBank in 2016 for 32 billion US dollars. No one's ever heard of it, and it only has 4,000 employees. So they, they, they have to do something to be worth 32 billion. And basically what they were selling was their ecosystem. So the reason I mentioned them is that they thought very carefully about what the keystone might be. And they, they decided early on, although they got into this ecosystem thing by accident, but they realized fairly early on that the risk chip, the reduced instruction set, com uh, set computing design was probably a potential keystone. You can think of the risk chip design as the boiler room in a device. So it handles all the stuff in the background. And the reason they realized that could be a keystone is because everyone that they sold it to and everyone who used it, like Apple or, or Nokia or Samsung or so, um, it was, they wanted performance, but they didn't need it to be differentiated because the differentiation was created on top of the arms keystone. And because it didn't need to be differentiated, they could become the de facto standard because everybody just wanted performance. It didn't matter that it wasn't different from other people because the customer doesn't see it, right? So, and, and by, um, by providing a de facto standard, they gave the customers choice of chip supplier, which is incredibly important in a cyclical business like semiconductors. 
where there's a shortage of chips, or if you're dependent on Intel, you, you, they, they, they basically charge a huge price premium for the fact that it's Intel. And, and so they're able to, to see that looking at the value chain, there was this piece of it where they could build an ecosystem of people that could take all the technology and consumer roadmaps and boil it down into the sort of highest common denominator of, the, of this design. And so you can, it's, it's not easy to know where the keystone is going to be, but it's, there are certain things you can think about. And one of the things you can think about is that the thing you provide can be used by lots of people in the ecosystem without undermining their differentiation. So Amazon Web Services cloud service is also fits the same thing. <laughs> lots of people can use it, differentiate on it, get benefit from it. It doesn't matter that everyone's using the same thing. So there are different characteristics of keystones, but in these ecosystems, one of the key things about it is that everybody in the ecosystem can benefit from your uh, 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 keystone. So it's got a kind of public good aspect to it. So that, that, that yeah. music. Oh, that, that's very interesting, actually. That's a good way of putting it. Um, so, uh, uh, and this, it's a, I think it's a very good answer to a difficult question. So let me try with another difficult question. Right? <laughs> <laughs> uh, so, so, okay, so it, it, like, let me take you to a, a industry that you just mentioned, you know, autonomous driving, the, the connected car, as we're calling it. Um, that, that's an industry also with a lot of players are coming in, you know, after the success of Tesla, you know, this, uh, this is just a, a, a handful of, I mean, a, a, actually a, a whole bunch of players who are coming in with different, uh, you know, skills and different uh, strength. Uh, and it is clear, at least to me, I want your, your reaction to this, that software will be, you know, pretty close to the keystone. I mean, you're not, I'm not, you know, maybe you'll be more detailed on this, but, you know, and then you see companies like, for instance, this week, uh, Volkswagen, the group Volkswagen announced that they are creating a new software division because they want to control the architecture. They only have 10% of the software in a, in, a, in a Porsche or an Audi car is actually from Volkswagen, and they want that to be at least 60%. And because they, they realize that that's where kind of the keystone, just to follow the argument. So now here's the, key, the tough question. Now, uh, so as we know that ecosystems and platforms are important, you know, there's a lot, everybody's trying to create one. And so now, so when everybody knows what the secret is, basically, you know, you have to lead that platform. How do you win these competitive battles? I mean, now you have companies like, you know, um, uh, you know, Audi and, you know, the, the, the Volkswagen group and Ford and Tesla now competing with Microsoft, competing with Amazon that is also there, competing with, uh, you know, companies on the software side, the hardware side, you know, the, so how do you, what are the kind of, things that you have to keep in mind now, you know, when you're not the only person that realized that, you know, there's a keystone, uh, now more, a lot of them actually kind of have the same idea. How do you win those battles? Right. As you say, a tricky question. So let, let, me, uh, let me say a few things about so, so let me start with what you don't do. <laughs> and that is try and buy up all the bits and <laughs> create a classic vertically integrated company or supply chain to do this. So, I mean, interestingly, we, we started out, uh, one of the companies we were going to have in the book was Ford, because in the, in the early days, they said, uh, we see this mobility thing, we want to build an ecosystem. <laughs> And we found what they ended up doing was buying up everybody, <laughs> creating a classic supply chain, which was totally not going to work in this, in this case. So within, within the, uh, the big mobility ecosystem, they're going to be uh, sort of sub-ecosystems, <laughs> and so part of it is choosing one of those sub-ecosystems. So it's interesting, if you look at Waymo, they're, they're now moving toward not trying to build over even a whole car. They're saying, you know, we're really going to focus on the autonomous control system. I, I worked with a company in, in Austria called TT Tech that they make 
the software that does the fly-by-wire in, in Airbus. So you, uh, I, I could talk a lot about that because it's fascinating what, what, what the equivalent of redundancy that we had in old aircraft is in software that you use for flying. <laughs> I, I should say they didn't design what's in the 737 MAX, but anyway, <laughs> they, they, they found they're, they're trying to carve out another keystone with its own ecosystem in this area of the, of the critical uh, software that, that is um, underlying what Waymo has in terms of you know, the, the communication between us and the safety aspect of it. So, so um, you know, f finding, finding that is, is a start. So within a big, the big ecosystem, finding a, 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 a sub ecosystem that, that actually you can, can you can lead as, as but, but Peter, Peter, sorry to interrupt, but even in that sub ecosystem, for instance, there's a whole bunch of companies trying to do that. I mean, you know, you know, you, you mentioned way more, but there's many companies that are sort of software only play. Yes. Yeah, in, yeah. Including, yeah. you know, yeah. uh, Nusen, you know, the, the, the makers of Dragon software, for instance, they have a big uh, um, facility in Montreal, actually, just dedicated to this autonomous driving, the software side, you know, so. Yeah. So, so, so the I, question is still. I, the question still is, is still valid even at, in, at the level of the yeah, system, yeah. you know? So, so if I can break down your question to a sub, subset of things. So, so the first thing is to think about, do I try to lead that part of the ecosystem or do I become a participant in, and let someone else lead it? And we, we, we talk about that in terms of two kind of questions to, to think about in answering that. One is how pivotal is your potential role in that ecosystem? So, or to put it another way, how much will your partners need to depend on you? So are you, you know, are you absolutely critical? And the second question is how critical will any specific partner be to you successfully executing your business model. Yeah. Mm -hmm. and, and if you have a critical role to play in the ecosystem and you're not that dependent on any single partner, then you can probably be the ecosystem leader. Mm -hmm. But on the converse, if you're not critical uh, and you're highly dependent on a specific partner, you need, probably need to join their ecosystem. And then there's a difficult thing in between, uh, which, which is, you, you, yes, you do have a critical role to play, but you're dependent on quite a few other partners. And in, in, in that case, what you're going to see is competition between people trying to create ecosystems that compete with each other. So they don't compete, uh, uh, as companies, they compete as ecosystems. So I think in the mobility space, what you're going to see is there's a Waymo ecosystem developing and there's some other one. <laughs> there are uh, probably quite a few. And, and, and if you're going to compete in that world, you better learn how to be a good ecosystem leader. <laughs> so, <laughs> so doing the things that I mentioned are going to be important. And just one other thing on that. Um, yeah, and then, I'll, and then I'll open the, the yeah, floor for questions, actually. To yeah. say is that I think it, when we think about the competition between two potential ecosystems, what's going to be important is not speed to market, but speed to scale. So how quickly can you scale up this ecosystem and how dynamic in terms of its innovation and learning potential can you get it to be so so that's uh, uh, you're, you're competing now on whether or not you can successfully lead the ecosystem and get it to scale up fast basically yeah. that's a, that's actually a very good point and, and in many cases i mean i you know like uh, you can say even uh, in the social media uh, 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 ecosystem you know 
Facebook was able to scale much faster than, uh, than the earlier competitors. Um, let me see if that, uh, let me just open the floor for questions. Ravi actually has a question here that I will read, but let me also uh, get other uh, people involved. Um, you guys, can you put your video and jump in or raise your hand? I'm watching the hands here to see if I have also, and if I miss somebody, um, Ravi or, or Magda, let me know. But um, so let me just uh, uh, start with Ravi's question here. You know, Ravi uh, is asking, to everybody, but I think it would be great if you tackle this. You know, does every ecosystem have one and only one leader? And what is, uh, that's one question, part A. And part B is, uh, what advice would you give to companies that are peripheral uh, to the ecosystem? They're not, they're not even pretending to be the leaders, you know? Yes, okay, good. So, um, yes, this, this, this question <laughs> does, does come up. When you look at the things that the ecosystem leader uh, has to do, I think it's quite difficult to have more than one leader of the ecosystem. Now, that's not to say that a big ecosystem, as we were discussing, Fernando and Ravi, like mobility, will have sub ecosystems, but I don't think that those sub ecosystems can have two leaders. I think. You know, you've got to have the roadmap. You've got to do things to, uh, you know, incentivize the the partners. You've got to, you've got to. So it's quite difficult to uh, to do it. You might also have to discipline some of the partners, or even throw them out if they're kind of freeloading on the ecosystem. So uh, I think it's quite difficult to, uh, if there's more than more than one. Um, <clears throat> the advice I'd have for people that are participants in one of these ecosystems is got to do with making sure that the ecosystem has a clear value proposition to you. Why are you better off joining the, the ecosystem? Um, if I go back to ARM for a minute, why does Samsung participate in the ecosystem and share its future product and technology roadmap with ARM? Well, because they know that there's a de facto standard going to emerge and, the, and it's from their point of view, it cuts the cost of this uh, design. It allows them choice of chip manufacturers and it allows faster innovation. Um, but by sharing more of their roadmap, they can pull the uh, de facto standard toward them. So, so they have thought carefully about, A, what do I get out of uh, being part of this ecosystem? And two, how do I get the ecosystem to look more like what I want it to look like? So, mm -hmm. so that, that's a key. Uh, they're, to two key considerations for participants in the ecosystem because you, you're not in this because you love the idea or you love the leader you're in it because it's going to be beneficial to you yeah great thank you uh i think there uh yeah there's a question actually uh from george Yip. hey george hi um, the question is, what are the costs and disadvantages of being part of an ecosystem uh, basically what do you have to give up to be yeah. Okay. So, uh, so, so that's that's a very very good question. And uh, when when we were when we were writing the book, uh, one of the things that we had to admit is that ecosystems aren't for everybody. <laughs> and. Uh, they're, they're simply not efficient at doing things where the product and service design is pretty stable, where the roles of the different partners are pretty well defined, where the interfaces are clear, and where you don't need a lot of innovation and agility. So <laughs> normal vertically integrated companies, markets, or supply chains are much better at doing that. Okay, so you only want to have an ecosystem when you need the three things I mentioned earlier, trying to uh, realize an uncertain vision, 
trying to speed up innovation and learning and trying to get more flexibility. Mm -hmm. So the downsides are that from a transaction cost point of view, it's not as efficient as a supply chain or a vertically integrated company. From a control point of view, it's more risky. You're more likely to also have IP leakage and other issues in an ecosystem. So there are downsides. So, so you shouldn't try to apply an ecosystem where you don't need the three things I mentioned. To yeah, discover yeah. Innovation and organic, and the interesting thing about that is that we found that once those three requirements went away, and the the um, value proposition became very clear, the role of partners became very clear, then the ecosystem starts to move to look more like a supply chain. <laughs> but what the smart people did is, as I mentioned with Alibaba's thing. They, they use the ecosystem to spawn another ecosystem. So once one kind of evolved to the supply chain, that was fine. And now we'll have a new one. <laughs> so, so they kept on expanding their business. And I, I think you can see a little bit of that at Amazon. You yeah, know, um, the, the core business has become more traditional because the, the full ecosystem approach is not efficient to do that but new ones are sort of being created around it. Yeah, George, I see you there. I'm not sure if you have a follow-up uh, comment or question on that. Uh, yeah, my question is actually, wasn't so much for the leader of the ecosystem, but for the followers in the ecosystem. I think like, this what, you about for the leader, what about for the follower? I, I think this is, uh, this is what uh, you were talking, Peter, no? Or did I get it wrong? Yes, yes. I thought you were talking about for the leader. Well, I said what I think the followers should do. Yes, yes. Okay, all right. All yeah, right, so okay. thank you. Yeah. Um, uh, so we have another question here from uh, uh, Leon, Lion Lee, um, and says, uh, thanks for sharing your thoughts. Uh, may I ask, how could an ecosystem be better prepared and thrive in a political uh, and economic turbulent environment? I think this is, a, this is the idea. Yeah, turbulency in the political an economic environment. I mean, basically, you know, I guess uh, in a situation like we are experiencing today in the U.S. and in many parts of the world, actually, with the pandemia effect on the economics and also in, in some countries in politics, um, I guess the question would be: Are ecosystems better prepared than traditional businesses to deal with this, or not? So yes, <laughs> I think they're a lot better prepared. <laughs> And why do I think that? Well, well, there's a couple of reasons. I mean, if we, if we just go to the current uh, coronavirus crisis, I mean, the Germany's president, Frank Walter Steinmeier, said something interesting the other day that really struck me. He said, no single entity covers the medical, economic, and political elements required to produce a vaccine for all in the world. So... <laughs> You just can't do it. So, so the first reason I, I think uh, ecosystems are good in these environments is they can bring together capabilities and knowledge that simply don't exist in one organization uh, to do things. But the second reason is because they're very good at promoting learning and they're very good at promoting flexibility because of this kind of self-organizing uh, thing, they're actually the best way to deal with uh, disruption and, and uncertainty and uh, political problems. So, and and I, I guess the other advantage they might have in a difficult political environment is that um, you, it, they're, not, they're not associated with just one company. So, I mean, you, I, I guess you have to think about a little bit how much you're going to brand the ecosystem as yours <laughs> or how much you're going to sort of let it be more of an organic thing that, that's there even if you're kind of leading it so uh, our contention is ecosystems are, are really well um, designed to do new things in a disruptive uh, environment uh, great. So we have another question here. Um, let me just read this a longer question uh, from uh, Joe. Uh, it seems uh, ecosystems emerge in blossoming technologies where profit margins are high. I 
first of all, I'd like to parenthesis there. I don't think that's always true. I mean, you know, look at how much money Uber is losing and many other. Uh, <laughs> but, but, but anyway, but it's actually an interesting thought that it, it's true that so many um, ecosystem leaders are actually very profitable. As more and more companies enter the ecosystem, does any cooperation within the ecosystem begin to deteriorate as a result of less efficient ecosystem? So the, the idea is that, you know, whether, um, you know, I guess size starts to, uh, you know, erode the foundations of the ecosystem that makes it so successful. I guess that's, that's where the issue is, no? I think. Uh, it says, uh, does any cooperation within the ecosystem begin to deteriorate resulting in a less efficient ecosystem? Um, I, I, I can oh, just quickly... Why don't you find your question? <laughs> I can, I, I, yeah, I can clarify. Um, my thought yeah. is that uh, early on, there's, there's significant cooperation, I mean, even within competitors, uh, because there's, there are these high margins and everyone's kind of, they're all wanting a piece and ultimately they all want to, they all want to be leaders of this emerging ecosystem. Uh, so my thought is very early on, there's a lot of cooperation, but as more and more companies enter this ecosystem, um, it seems that companies would become uh, more defensive and then that would kind of erode the early collaboration that existed within the ecosystem that kind of helped it blossom. Yes. Okay. Well, uh, in, interesting, in, interesting question, Joe. So, so let me say a couple of things. Let, let me first deal with the, the margin thing. So one of the cases in the book is, a, is the Guardian newspaper. It used to be the Manchester Guardian in the UK. Uh, very, very traditional industry, declining circulation, declining margins. I mean, they have, <laughs> they have built one of the world's most successful news portals by <laughs> building an ecosystem that draws on other people's content as well as their own and other people's advertising customer relationships into this ecosystem. So it doesn't necessarily have to be starting from a high margin, high tech kind of business. So, so that's the, the, the first thing I would say. The, the second thing I would say is that um, what we found is that good ecosystem leaders are always thinking about how do I increase the size of the pie rather than how does the pie get divided up. So um, one of the answers to your question is, Joe, that you can continue to encourage cooperation if the size of the pie is growing. So, so network effects can help you with that, um, but it's, it's part of the ecosystem leader's role to work out how much it has to reinvest in the ecosystem so that the ecosystem keeps creating more and more value so the pie gets bigger. Uh, as the ecosystem matures, you might find that some of the participants in the ecosystem start competing with each other, but you still have to maintain as the ecosystem leader a situation where they're better off being part of the ecosystem versus not being part of the ecosystem. But, but the key thing is to be always thinking let's make the pie bigger. And, and one of the discussions I often had with executives in this area is that they still have this kind of supply chain thinking that says, if, if he earns or she earns more, I earn less. It, yes. it doesn't matter in the ecosystem. <laughs> in ARM's ecosystem, Apple and Intel are earning much more than ARM. <laughs> but the only question ARM needs to ask itself is, Am I better off with the ecosystem than not with the ecosystem? <laughs> it's irrelevant whether Apple's super profitable. <laughs> In fact, it's probably great from the ecosystem's point of view. So, <laughs> so always thinking about how do I keep on increasing the size of the pie as an ecosystem leader is important. Great. Thank you. Thank you. Thank that's, you. That's, that's great, Peter. Yeah. Thank you, Joe, for the question. Um, we have another question here. We have two, actually. We only have five minutes, so you, I, I will ask you two short answers that we finish on time. Ah. But one question from Stephen is, um, can established ecosystems evolve, or do they usually have to dissolve and reestablish? And I'm thinking, when I read this question, I thought, oh, gosh, you know, 
Symbian, Nokia, and the, the smartphone industry change. I mean, those guys tried to change the, um, the ecosystem, evolved into the new smartphone world, and they could never do it. Now, so I guess it's a great question. You know, can yeah. systems yeah. evolve so, so, or not? Yeah, so back, back to something I said earlier. While the three things still exist in the industry, I, if you have to discover the value proposition, you need a lot of learning and innovation, and you need flexibility, then the ecosystem can continue. So once those things go away, you probably have to create a new, new ecosystem. So interestingly, in the case of ARM, what you see is that the original ecosystem has pretty much remained because the requirements of creating new value through mobile devices with uncertainty and the need for learning and innovation and flexibility has, has been maintained in that industry. But once the sort of product stabilizes and the value proposition stabilizes, you probably need to, to uh, evolve a new ecosystem. And uh, in most cases, and in, in, this is also true of ARM, uh, it's, it needed to then spawn a new ecosystem. So this new ecosystem is about Internet of Things, because Internet of Things is now stronger in the three requirements than mobile phones. But <laughs> mobile phones still have enough, not in so much the product, but in the total value proposition, that mm -hmm. the ecosystem can, can uh, continue. But basically, once you stabilize things, the ecosystem will will degrade and move toward a more classic structure. Okay, we have one minute for the next question, which is okay. similar to my question on what's the difference between platform and ecosystems that you took. Uh, ben Greg is asking, how would you distinguish between uh, the ecosystem structure you described and open innovation? Okay, so. Uh, Open innovation can be part of the ecosystem I described. It's, it's just that there's stronger leadership in the ecosystem I've described than in pure open innovation. And there's more attention to what value you and different partners are, create, are taking out of the ecosystem. So it, it, it's, it's, it's structured a bit more. In, and one of the ways you can think about this very quickly is in the ecosystem sits somewhere between a company and a market. And the open innovation is a bit closer to the market with a bit less structure and, yes. and leadership. Great, that's a great way to put it. And this is perfect timing. To uh, Peter, I mean, it has been a pleasure to moderate this discussion. I, it's really always nice to talk to you. And I'm going to give it back to Ravi for the final closing. Ravi, thanks Thank again. you. Thanks well, for a great job, Fernando. Yes, indeed. Thank you, Fernando. And thank you, Peter, for uh, great uh, responses to all, all, the, all the questions. I think we could have gone on much, much longer. Uh, I've learned a lot of useful things. These, you know, these industries are around us, and we're all watching them take shape and it's nice to have a way to think about them uh, and I think you've given uh, me certainly lots of uh, ways to slice it and conceptualize what's going on so thank you for that and uh, I don't know what you're working on next but whatever your next book is uh, you always have an audience here with us at the Center for Emerging Markets at Northeastern University <laughs> and uh, look forward to uh, meeting you in person, Peter, when we have the opportunity. And Fernando, again, thank you so much for uh, uh, moderating this. I knew this was your cup of tea and uh, it was great to see uh, your back and forth with lots of interesting questions. Thank you to the audience as well for, uh, for joining us. And uh, we'll see you all at the next event. Thank you. Thank you Thanks a lot. Yep. Thank you very much. Yep. Yep. Thank you, Peter. Thank you. Thank you, Peter. Thank you, everybody. Bye-bye. Pleasure. Thank you. My pleasure.